yes, uh, you know, like cycling came to me at my darkest time. I, you know, I was going through a divorce. Um, you know, I, I met, had my uh, high school sweetheart. Um, you know, we were together 13 years. We have a baby together, and it's falling apart, and we're growing apart. And uh, you know, I just needed an outlet, and it was. I didn't go looking for it; it found me. So was, you know, I I wanted to go I, mountain bike, go in the forest, uh, you know, be with my thoughts, beat the shit out of myself, kind of take some control of my life that felt like it was all falling apart. And it's always been therapy. So yeah, and so I'm intense. I, I'm, uh, you know. I, I understand that. I get this. You know, I, I'm scary sometimes. Even though I don't feel scary, I get it. All the feedback all the time, like, whoa, you know, like, dude, you, you don't know what you do to me when you're even not around. Like, just, you know, and so this is something that I've, you know, I've had to kind of deal with my whole life. And so uh, it's unfortunate. I do have some people I know. I, I, make, I, I don't make them feel good. I was pissed. We didn't come down here to DNF. What the fuck is going on? I'm like, I'm trying to bang heads together, motivate them, get them going. Like, boys, we're jet fuel. We're down here. Like, I need, I need, I didn't see you all race with. And I remember Dave Byer, like, you know, and it was a, a real, I'll never forget this moment. He was kind of like, like, I'm giving everything I have, man. That, that was my all. Like, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like, every, like, come on, there's no way. And he's like, no, no, no. That was my, like, you can't, I can't even give you, un, like, and then the other guys are nodding too. Like, that was my, and then I remember thinking, like, effort you know that's all I asked for anybody you know I was like okay I can live with that you know like that was and so it was a, a shift to say like uh, you know just give me give me everything you got and I will I will love you to death just give me everything you got hey just to let you know Ed's come down real bad like it's it's not good he's in a bad way uh, we're not too sure you know what the next few days look like what happened? What happened? That was a heavy email for me to get, and obviously you had no awareness that email was even going out at the time. But do you are you in a place to talk about the crash? Ed, welcome back to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Great to be back. Every time we chat, Ed, I end up uh, we end up talking for like sixty minutes before I press record on the podcast. Yeah, I know. I was thinking, about, yeah, I enjoy that. So I love catching up. But uh, the last podcast we have is my second most ever downloaded podcast i was looking through the stats last night and tyler hamilton uh, i think the podcast with tyler hamilton's called forgiveness and rebirth and it's total fire like he's talking about you know epo on the u.s postal team armstrong hincapi and then a podcast with with you which i've titled get faster as we age it's our second most ever downloaded podcast i just thought that's fucking wild did it hit like 35 36 people <laughs> it was my mom my sister your mom your dad yeah, i called out all the aunts and uncles yeah <laughs> it, it, it's pretty crazy because it's it feels like the same conversations we'd have in your back garden on a barbecue having beers 10 years ago now we're just recording them but there's you know tens of thousands of people listening in yeah, who who knew that uh, people be interested in that? You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I was thinking about my relationship with fitness and something that I'm not sure a lot of people know. And you've stayed at my parents' house, Ed. You know, my dad has suffered with obesity his whole life. So the kind of backstory to that is he was kind of a chubby kid. Then he found sport and he was a pro badminton player. And he had an accident in his early 30s and he lost some of his toes, a forklift accident on a construction site. And he lost some of his toes. And after that, he piled on weight. So I grew up my whole life seeing the lifestyle limitations that excess weight brings, like the stuff my dad couldn't do with me and my sister that other parents could. So my hard line in the sand where it's not something I really ever talk about, but I tell people my motivation for training is to win bike races to be the best i can you know this can dancer but that's bullshit my actual reason is i never want to have that lifestyle limitation that i see my dad have what do i need to know about your childhood to understand the way you view life and how you prioritize stuff now uh it's crazy that you're touching on this because uh well, i went through something similar so um you know, growing up, my parents didn't really have much and they, they got to feed three boys and, uh, you know, we were, we were eating the worst possible foods, you know, the cheapest. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to make ends meet and they're trying to, but I mean, I couldn't have ate worse. So like, I went, you know, we, we got pretty chubby, we, you know, we we're eating crap and, uh, you know, I, I got a, a big, you know, we're talking like, say, you know, between 
10, 15, I, I was quite overweight. You know, I had stretch marks. I had a stomach. I had a big belly button. And, uh, you know, and, and both my, uh, my younger brothers did too. And so when I, I started to move a little bit more with sport and that, you know, and, and then I grew up, you know, I, I gained a foot of height and it kind of stretched out. So it went from being this, you know, dumpy kid to like, you know, six foot, you know, just stretched out. I was lucky. But uh, my younger brother... Um, he, he struggled, he didn't move as much and he didn't, uh, wasn't playing, you know, he wasn't as active and he got up to almost 300 pounds. And so that was one of the things, uh, you know, I was, you know, w- witnessing that and I was seeing what he was going through and it was very hard and it was almost like, you know, I was already, you know, his older brother and protective and looking after him, but it was something I was very sensitive about, you know, anybody making jokes or anybody, uh, you know, I'm getting emotional now, but <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, Hey, that didn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of, uh, you know, watching him uh, find the gym, you know, in his 20s and he became a gym rat and he uh, lost it all. And, he get, he, you know, he's very proud. Um, so it was it was just one of those things where, you know, the lifestyle, you know, as a kid really affected both of us. So even though I, you know, didn't uh, wasn't, you know, overweight, you know, I, I got lucky um you know, witnessing what he went through and then how, what he had to overcome. And then, you know, even, even to this day, like some of the stuff that he goes through with that stigma of being the the big kid or the, you know, the overweight kid. Um, yeah, it motivates me too. So yes, uh, you know, like cycling came to me at my darkest time. I, you know, I was going through a divorce. Um, you know, I, I had my uh, high school sweetheart, um, you know, we we're together 13 years, we have a baby together and it's fallen apart and we're growing apart. And, uh, you know, I just needed an outlet and it was, I didn't go looking for it. It found me. So, you know, I, I wanted to go I mountain bike, go in the forest, to, uh, you know, be with my thoughts, beat the shit out of myself, kind of take some control of my life that felt like it was all falling apart. And it's always been therapy. So, yeah. And the way you set your life up now, we were talking off air about, uh, somebody I was talking to recently and their currency for trying to impress someone was talking about how many cool cars they have. And you said when somebody says that to you, you just immediately know how little they understand what makes you tick, what impresses you, what motivates you. You've set your life up in a very deliberate way to put fitness as a huge part of your life. Is that still motivated by those early experiences of your parents scraping to get you know, food on the table or how much you think that impacts you now? Yeah, I, I have some money issues. That's for sure. I, I, uh, I don't uh, strive to acquire good things or money. And so this is, uh, you know, people look at me like, Oh, you could do this and that. And it's like, no, I, I do like connection. I love, um, you know, I think of my parents are pretty content and they've got some beautiful relationships and they, I didn't know when I was growing up how, um, they designed their life. You know, they, they provided for us. They were great parents. Okay. Like what, what I enjoy and some of the stuff that, uh, and I know not everyone has this, you know, and that's why I'm so fortunate and grateful and, and, uh, but yeah, I, I, I was loved to death. You know, I had, uh, you know, we were carted around, we got taken places. We, you know, uh, we didn't have fancy shit. Okay. But I don't, I don't have a story that I ever went without, uh, wondering, you know, where, why dad wasn't there or why mom wasn't, you know, that that's not, you know, I, I won the, the lottery that way. So I still look at that, you know, it took me a while to understand that, you know, you could want, well, hey, why, why do they have a big house and why, Hey, why do they have a pool? You know, Hey, how come, how come you guys are working harder? I want Air Jordans. Like, come on, you know, like you, you, but with age, it's kind of like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. That I actually, you know, I reflect now and I'm, my mom will say to me like, Oh, I wish we could have done more for you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like what? You know, I won the lottery. So, what? so yeah, it, de- it definitely, eff- so when I hear about, you know, these poor, that poor sap that, uh, you know, has to impress you with his cars or whatever, I feel like, oh man, that, that you're coming to the wrong guy. That doesn't, you know, I, I like high performers and I, I do think you should get, uh, you know, the, the return of your hard work, you know, I'm all for that. But, uh, if you think that's why I want to be your friend or in your company, yeah, you got the, you're talking to the wrong guy. I've got uh, that's we've shared you know a a commonality on many things and that's you know not viewing life through a solely monetary lens is one of them but I got a term for it recently which and I'm trying to now accumulate more of these assets I call them invisible assets it's the stuff you can't touch you can't see you can't put it into a box it's non-tangible like generosity like being present like kindness like attention attention is such a 
difficult one. You meet someone for a coffee now and it's like the stoic saying is be where your feet are. And that's what I'm trying to do because so many people are like, you're with them, but they're somewhere else. They're Instagramming someone that's across the world. And then when they're with that person across the world, they're Instagramming someone on the far side of the world. It's like, be present. And that's an invisible asset, but it seems like a lot of the stuff that your parents saw to you at an early age that you maybe at the time only measured actual assets and not the make-believe ones I've invented. <laughs> no, it's funny you say that. So how do you know when you're a kid? You don't know. You don't know what you like. You don't know what you look for. You you say, I like that person. I want them to be my best friend. Oh, I like their company. But you don't, I, I wouldn't be able to put into words what it actually is. You know, like they, they, but now like what you just did is like, no, they, they look me in the eye. They nod and they, they, uh, they're, 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 they're Nonverbal communication is what I look forward to. It's beautiful. You know, like when we sit down and we have like an intimate moment, it's intimate. You know, they're there. And so like, I really like them. I want, I want to be with them. I want to see them tomorrow. You know, I want to call them. What are you doing this weekend? You know, so as a kid, you're just kind of like, yeah, they're cool or whatever. You know, like, but now I'm starting to piece together like, w- w- like whose company do I keep? And I do really believe that you become who you hang out with. Okay. So, you know, uh, it doesn't mean you have to trim all the fat on, you know, everybody that's struggling or everybody that's not in perfect alignment. Okay. But I mean, if I have a choice with my time and my time's very valuable, you know, this is, this is who I want to hang out with. Okay. And so the, uh, what's interesting about the high performers is there's a good chance that if someone's, um, has all that, you know, they, they also do well for themselves and they also ride a bike fast and they also have a great relationship. And they, and so, you know, most people are, you know, are pretty well rounded. So when you find a high performer, they're pretty high performing across the board. And in in my uh, you know, I was thinking about high performers recently, and someone was asking me, you know, what is the trait that kind of links high performers? And I don't know what that trait is, or I don't know if there is one trait that links high performers. But for me, any high performers I know, whether it's sport or business, I think I love the phrase that high performance happens in the shadows. You know, you don't get it's like. It's do the session when you're not motivated to do the session. Do the session when nobody's watching. Do the session when you're going to get no credit for doing the session. Do the session if you're sick. Do the session if you don't feel like doing the session. That's high performance. And it's like, that's why I love that expression. High performance happens in the shadows because that like encapsulated all those scenarios in one for me. Yeah, no, this is great. I, I agree. Um, what, what about um, like for yourself? Like people, the, the motivation should be internal. Like, you know, you, like we, we, as a performer, as a, a competitor, you know, you, you want your medal or you want to get up on stage or you want uh, some social media love or whatever. Right? But what about like, you know, here at the house, I, I, my character and my standard makes me, makes the floors clean. You know, it also makes the, the, the fridge tidy or, you know, like I, or the cupboards in a certain way or like there's a standard that you should hold yourself to for you. Okay. And so that, that's something you can develop. I, I feel like when I leave the house, you know, I, you know, make sure, okay, do I got, you know, like, I, I, I want, there's a standard. Some people's standards need to come up. You know, some people are, I put them so high, they could never meet them and they're always miserable. Okay. So it's like making sure your standards in line and, and trying to live up to it. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I have a high standard. It's not out of whack. So that's why I'm not miserable, but it's definitely not, you know, I just feel like if someone comes over right now, they could come in the house and they're like, it's lived in, but you know, we keep it a certain, you know, I have something I'm proud of. That's the same thing with training. That's the same thing with work. That's, I think it's across the board. There's a training partner of mine and he's had a number of crashes and he's new into the sport. His bike handling's not brilliant, but he's had a, a number of crashes and I was out training with him last week and his kit's dirty, his bike's dirty, his handlebar tape is scuffed up and is fixed with insulating tape, his Garmin is pieced together and then it runs out of battery halfway through a session. And I got thinking about exactly what you talked about there, standards. It's not like the broken Garmin that's not charged caused them to crash, but I, I love that saying of how you do anything is how you do everything. And if you're the sort of person who's not charging your Garmin, who's not going to the effort to lay out clean kit before, you're maybe the sort of person that goes into a corner a little bit too hot and doesn't think, ah, oh, I wonder what the line is like. I wonder what the grip is like. How old are these tires? Understanding different pressures. It feeds into that. And I love that idea of having that standard permeating the rest of your life as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I, uh, yeah, I 
I, I, I feel about my insecurities when you're saying that because my bike's always a little bit dirty and you know like I don't uh, I'm not saying I have a crack in my garment but I, I've, I've made some mistakes too and so that's the idea of uh, you know but if you're not doing those things like you said like I, being so OCD and like laying out your clothing and having a, like that's not a way to live either okay so I like to be a little bit loose a little bit but if where it's like where are your thoughts if they're not there where else where are they if they're not on you know preparing for the ride or being in the moment on the ride where are they and so whether you, you know someone listening to this you're like you should think about this well where, where am i how do i slip out on a corner how did i lose awareness or focus like what was i thinking about you know am i still on instagram because i'm you know like am i still you know thinking about oh, what i left uh, you know was the oven on you know like what, where are your thoughts okay because so one of the strengths and this is one thing that's hard to explain and this is one of the gifts i was given is i i'm quite focused and I'm very, and I can really get hyper focused. It's a, it can be a detriment, it can be a problem. Okay, and so I, I try to relate to people that don't have that, but it's very hard for me. I'm like, what? When you when you're doing something, you don't just get like right in the moment. You know, it's like this podcast. The world could be burning around me. I'm in this podcast. This is this is a gift for now. Okay, when I when the podcast is over and I'm like, I check my phone and I missed a bunch of appointments. And I didn't get, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's a it's a double edged sword, but. Um, that's, that's where I would, with those people, you know, like try to pinpoint, you know, where did it go wrong? What, where is my, my passion or where is my thoughts when I'm missing these things? Where, where else am I? And then, you know, maybe that's where you should be going. If you're thinking about ballet, maybe you should get off the bike. And you know, if you're thinking about the opera, you know, but you have something that's rare and I've, you know, been a teammate as yours and now we're working together in a coaching capacity and you know, you have your standards. But you also raise people around you to your standards. And I've been a teammate of yours and I've been on teams where some people will come up to those standards and they'll peacock, the shoulders will go back and they'll be the best version of themselves. Others won't. Others will, the shoulders will curl and they will become a shell of themselves and it's just not for them. They're just, they, they can't operate at that level, at your standards. Your standards cripple them and they disappear. Is that something you've consciously cultivated? That sort of, you know, the ability to lead. I've messed that up lots of times, and so that's where you kind of find out who you're supposed to be with. I've had friends that this is before cycling. I've had friends that, uh, and that's where even when I look for friendship now is like when you're successful, you you cheer on the other person's success. When they're doing well, you're doing well. You're you're not competing. You're not. It's not like their success is taking away from mine. There, you know, some like back to a car or a house or whatever. That's not my thing. But I, I mean, I don't begrudge anybody that does well. I actually gravitate to those people. Like, you know, it's depending how they do it, you know, like it's not in my face. It's the same thing with sport. When, when you win a bike race, Anthony, it's not, not, doesn't take anything away from me. It's friggin' amazing. I'm a big fan, but that's not how everybody sees it. And so you, you, you you, when your company, you, you know, bring somebody in and if my success makes them feel like crap, yeah, it's probably best to, you know, move to another circle or something. And so I'm intense. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, I understand that. I get this. You know, I, I'm scary sometimes. Even though I don't feel scary, I get it all the feedback all the time. Like, whoa, you know, like, dude, you, you don't know what you do to me when you're even not around. Like, just, you know, and so this is something that I've, you know, I've had to kind of deal with my whole life. And so it's unfortunate. I do have some people I know. I, I, make, I, I don't make them feel good, you know, but I, I got to be me. And, and so we just kind of go our separate ways and it's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing it, uh, you know, maliciously. I'm not trying to like, I'm just being me. And if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Because I, I can remember Jeff, you I wasn't going to name names, but you know what? Well, he's probably not even listening. I remember it was a good biker, Kevin Hazard. And I remember just thinking he just couldn't step up to the standards you set on that team. And other guys on the team did step up. You know, you had Pete Morris and stuff. He was an amazing lead out man for you. And he's, you know, he'd, he'd kill a man on the way to drop you off at the line. But some shirk and some peacock, and maybe that's just the nature of being around leaders that are at high performance. Uh, I've toned that down. Okay, so this one thing about the... I used to go into a mentality of kind of like a football or hockey player or like the intimidation thing, okay? And so I, I was coming from a different sport and uh, <laughs> or a different attitude, and I really um, thought it was okay to... You know, I don't know, just give off. I had this whole thing, the bubble of fuck off, okay? I would put on, it's like a porcupine, okay? It's like, I thought some people could see through it. Like, you know, when we have our close friends, we go for beers, we hang out. Like, it's not to you. The bubble of fuck offs for the for the other guys on the other side. What are you talking about? Like, but that that became something that, um, yeah. And I remember sitting down, we were, I was with Jeff Fuel, I was with Kevin Hazard, it was Dave Byer. 
um, might have been Steve Meyer. There was somebody else. We were down at USA Crits, and I just they took me down here the first time. Okay, I go down with these guys. They're going to show me the races. We get in the jet fuel van. You know, I've never done these things. And right out of the gate, um, I get on the computer or anything, and I destroy it. The very first race, I think I get twentieth or something. I'm thinking this is what we're doing. These guys are like. They, they, they're DNFing, you know, like they're having struggling like that, you know, at the next race, the same thing. I get 25th or whatever, everyone DNFs. So finally we would go for dinner. The, you know, we're out getting a sub, we're sitting outside. I remember sitting outside and I was pissed. We didn't come down here to DNF. What the fuck is going on? I'm like, I'm trying to bang heads together, motivate them, get them going. Like, boys, we're jet fuel. We're down here. Like, I need, I need, I didn't see you all race with, and I remember Dave Byer, like, you know, and it was, a, a real, I'll never forget this moment. He was kind of like, like. I'm giving everything I have, man. That that was my all. Like, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like every, like, come on, there's no way. And he's like, no, no, no. That was my, like, you can't, I can't even give you un, like, and then the other guys are nodding too. Like that was my, and then I remember thinking like effort, you know, that's all I asked for anybody. You know, I was like, okay, I can live with that. You know, like that was, and so it was a, a shift to say like, uh, you know, just give me, give me everything you got and I will, I will love you to death. Just give me everything you got. And so when those guys could sit there and, and truly and honestly, not, not the, some of the effort people take, like he, he was being like, it was a pretty intimate moment where he's looking me in the eye saying like, that was my all Ed. I can't give you anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I can, you know, I love you, man. You know, hugs. <laughs> okay. And then I had to tone shit down. I had to figure that out, you know? So it's like, when guys had potential or guys were really good and they were kind of half assed yeah, I, I, I zero in on those guys. But when a guy was at the limit and he was giving me his all, that's, you know, I give him lots of, oh, right, we'll get him next day. Or, yeah, you, you know, whatever, you know. So I wasn't always on everybody. I was trying to be more specific and more unique to the, that person. I want to take a little bit of a left turn, and I'm not sure how open you are talking about this. Let's just edit it out if you're not. Uh, I got an email from a close friend of yours. I opened it up and the email was, hey, just to let you know, Ed's come down real bad. Like, it's it's not good. He's in a bad way. Uh, we're not too sure, you know, what the next few days look like. What happened? What happened? So that was a heavy email for me to get. And obviously you had no awareness that email was even going out at the time. But do you are you in a place to talk about the crash? You already had me crying earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it was probably uh, as scary as anything I've ever been through. Um, yeah. I The first couple of days, uh, well, not the first couple of days. Let's just say right away. Rewind okay. even to what's going on. What, what's your last okay, yeah, memory before so, the crash? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the whole thing. So I'm in, um, I'm racing with a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, based team, uh, Automatic a Bus, A Bus. Um, and uh, we're in um, uh, Chicago at the Intelligentsia Cup. Um, it's day two. Uh, it's Winfield. It's just like a little suburb around the Chicago area. I raced earlier. So I've been doing like the master race earlier, kind of as a warm up, and then I do the pro race at night. And so I'd raced the course earlier, and I, I, it was perfect for me. Like it was when I, when, you know, I, I did really well in the master race. And then when I sat down with the guys and it was like a downhill sprint, perfect four corners. Like I, I was like, this is, this is going to be my day. And they pretty much said, yeah, it can be your day. So like a downhill sprint at this size, like, you know, <laughs> I was licking my chops. <laughs> so what's interesting is, um, you know, a lot of the stuff I had to piece together because, um, I don't remember the race. Okay. So this is what I'm telling you now is, you know, after watching video and, and talking to different people, um, they explained to me what happened, but, um, in the closing laps of the race, either, uh, I believe it was with one to go at a coming out of corner two, they, the group had always kept going to the left. They come out of the corner and they go right to the left side of the road. We're doing a counterclockwise. And so there was a lane on the right. And so in the master race, it was the same thing. They come out of corner two lane and I would go up the right side and I could go from wherever I was right to the front lap after lap after lap. And so I can only imagine that, you know, on the last lap, that's where I'm going. I'm going right to the front because I want to win this damn sprint. And so we come out of corner two, the group goes to the left. I go up the right, but it closes that lane. Like, you know, on every time in the last lap gets chaotic, things change. Not everyone, you know, as if I'm the only one who's thinking that yeah. lane. <laughs> and so I'd seen a video, um, where these two guys touched wheels earlier in the race. The guy had a GoPro in that. And the, one of the guys deviates right away. He sees them touch wheels. looks like they're going to crash. He goes to the right. He goes off course and he goes on the grass 
and he gets back on, okay? As I'm watching that, that's, that's what I did. It's identical, okay? And as he goes by, um, it's in the exact same spot, okay? So I, can, I leave the course, I jump over this curb, I go onto the grass on someone's front lawn, okay? Because it's on the back stretch where there's no barriers or whatever. It was open. And uh, the grass is soft. It's not, it's not, and all, you know, I try to turn, wheel, digs into the grass, you know, launches me over the handlebars right into this solid oak tree. Boom. Oof. Yeah. So the Garmin shows 52K an hour, dead stop. Okay. And so I don't remember. I don't remember the race. I don't remember any of this. I, all I know is, uh, you know, uh, scared a lot of people. Like, you know, people come running, all the first responders, the teammates, everybody, you know, and they, a lot of people thought I was dead. You know, they, they're like totally, uh, whatever out of it. And so I, you know, I kind of come to, and you know, and this is all pieced together what people told me, but I, uh, yeah, suffered, um, uh, I always forget the term, but I had a brain bleed. So if someone laughing at me that I don't actually know the name, but I broke a, a vertebrae C7. Um, I had a bruised lung that, that was crazy, painful and, uh, shattered my humerus. So my, uh, I had a big gash. It's, it's healed up nicely, but all my mouth was all open up. Like all uh, the helmet saved my life. The, the indent on this helmet. So from that, uh, I, I'd wear that helmet for the uh, A bus. If you're watching, <laughs> a lifetime, uh, yeah, like or life. That it, it saved my life. It was. It took. Uh, it was just crazy dented in, and I. I have it somewhere. The blood inside of it too. Like it's. It's a memento. It's a keepsake. You know. But uh, um, what's your first memory of waking up in the hospital? Oh, I, 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 I getting stitches, getting stitches. I remember the pin, the pin or whatever, the needle in my face. That's the very first moment. So I don't remember the, the, the ambulance. I don't remember a lot of stuff. So if you think about by the time you actually, how many hours later when they're actually stitching up my face and that's kind of the, the pain of that and going like, you know, that, and then I remember from then on. Do you have an awareness of how bad it was at that point? Well, I remember them, uh, no, not, not at that point, but they did, um, you know, I'm in a neck brace. I'm like laying in a, you know, I'm upright in a bed. Um, you know, they come in and speak to you and explain to you what's going on and, and how like, especially, so the focus was the brain, um, pressure, you know, like your brain's bleeding. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't know how serious it was going to be. I had a bunch of CAT scans and an MRI. They, they were, re you know, that was the focus. Like the rest of the stuff didn't matter. It was yeah. kind of like, you know, do we, do we need to, you know, relieve the pressure? What, you know, what are the next steps, um, for that? So yeah, that was that was scary. And then you know when you hear you, uh, you know you've got a broken vertebrae, like you're in a neck brace, like yeah, you know I, yeah, can you edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But yeah, it was scary, right? Like I'm I'm I have lots of um, you, you know friends that um, you know I've been in a hand cycle, I've I've been around wheelchair guys. I'm thinking like you know do I walk? Am I you know am able or is this it? Like you know so. Yeah, it was it was scary. The para stuff gives you a different lens to view those crashes through. When you're around those people, you see how bad it can be. Because like we're pretty reckless most of the time as bike riders, but when you get a chance to race tandems and you go to the World Cups and you see guys missing legs that are in hand cycles, yeah. when I think back to some of the crashes I have had, like one or two, I remember hitting the traffic island in the Pyrenees at like 89 kilometers an hour and waking up on the ground and just not being able to move, like sending the signal to the brain to say, okay, sit up. And then that signal just getting lost somewhere. Okay, okay, sit up. And then just thinking, having this sinking feeling of going, you absolute idiot, you're after getting paralyzed in a bike race. It's a scary, scary moment. And like, that's why I was curious your first moment in the hospital, because for me, that's always been the scariest moment when I've had a bad crash and my first recollection in the hospital. I remember twenty the year you were over for the Ross, actually, 2014, I crashed out on the first stage and got a head injury. I broke my collarbone, but again, obviously, they were scared about the head injury. And I woke up in hospital, and I remember seeing this guy in the bed across from me who was in the race as well, and he was ruined. Like, he's cuts everywhere. He's in bits. And he sees me waking up and he comes over to me and he goes, you okay, bro? You look terrible. And, <laughs> and I thought, if this guy is saying I look terrible, this is bad, bad news. That's awesome. That's so good. 